Hi, everyone. Welcome to this forum on Ukraine, sponsored by the Department of Economics, History, and Political Science, the Student Government Association, and the Office of Student Development. We have a panel structure today that I have sort of thought about as the past, present, and potential futures. We're going to hear from Professor Teresa Fava Thomas in history, uh, an expert on uh, diplomatic and world history, um, Professor Josh Sparrow and Mr. Oscar Pimentel uh, from political science to talk about sort of on the ground uh, from their experience in Poland and Ukraine uh, in recent months. And then from Professor Eric Budd of political science, an expert in peace studies, peace negotiations. We'll be thinking about some of the different options that exist. I'm Professor Catherine Jewell. I'm your moderator. Uh, I will be passing around some index cards through the event. If you just want to jot down questions, uh, you can pass them to the end of the row. I'll collect them uh, you know, just as you're thinking of them. We will also be recording and broadcasting this hopefully online. So I'll be taking questions from on the Google Meet as well. Fingers crossed, we all know how pandemic technology can go, but I am going to start by turning things over to Professor Thomas. Okay. Hi. Um, well, I wanted to start uh, by giving you some background. We are going to go all the way back to uh, Leo Tolstoy and talk a little bit uh, about the Russian view of war. Uh, we've got a map up here of the contemporary uh, Ukraine region. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Ukraine is one of the largest areas in the former Soviet uh, Socialist Republics. Uh, only Kazakhstan is as big as it is. If you overlay Ukraine, which is regarded as Ukraina in Slavic or a borderland, uh, if you overlaid that in the United States, it would roughly uh, go from Cleveland to about New York City. Uh, it is a massive land mass, and it is a very rich land which produces uh, a great deal of uh, food uh, and raw materials uh, for Ukrainians. And during the Soviet era, the Cold War era, which is uh, my area of specialization, uh, enormous asset uh, for uh, the Soviet Union. Leo Tolstoy, in War and Peace, which was a reflection on Napoleon's uh, invasion, the war began, that is, an event took place contrary to human reason and to the whole, nature, the whole of human nature. Now that tragedy uh, is going in a different direction. So um, Ukraine, even though uh, Putin's language is very much that he is reclaiming something, has a long history separate from Russia, has a population of about 44 million people. Um, there are very few countries that have a 100% literacy rating according to the CIA World Factbook. The norm is 15 years of education, uh, full education plus some college. They have and have always had a reputation within the Soviet Union uh, in the Cold War era of being a place where people had the technological knowledge and know-how. 40% of the Soviet Union's nuclear uh, fleet materials, uh, weapons, were produced in industrial sites within Ukraine. It has billions uh, in exports today. Grains, wheat, corn, barley, sugar beets. This is just a short list. Um, potatoes, all sorts of materials that are vital to life in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. Coal, iron ore, oil, some oil, not that much. A variety of metal ores, timber, and some gas. But its geostrategic value, its strategic asset, is as a warm water port, the entire south coastline, the Crimea region, if you need to know the one reason why uh, Russia's Atlantic fleet wants warm water ports, this is Murmansk. It's up by the North Pole, literally. Those people are not wearing masks because of COVID. They're wearing masks because it is so frigidly cold. The Soviet fleet during the Cold War had great deal of difficulty moving in and out of Murmansk, 
During the Second World War, it was a tremendous supply challenge for the United States sending Len Lease uh, to our then ally, uh, Joseph Stalin. Whether you're talking about Peter the Great in 1695 or Catherine the Great or Putin, uh, keeping access to Odessa and warm water ports has an enormous uh, to Russia's navy. 20th century. It became a Soviet socialist republic not long after the Russian Revolution. Stalin's brutal collectivization of the farms, whether you were a small farmer or someone that he termed the kulaks, the middle class farmers, suffered terribly. Two major famines, called the Holodomor, or the Black Famine, 1921 to 1922, and again 1931 to 1932. Uh, perhaps an estimated 8 million dead. During the Second World War, Stalin's Red Army, the Ukrainians and the Nazis fought over the land with, again, broad estimate, perhaps 8 million Ukrainian dead. And considering the total uh, Soviet dead in the Second World War was massive, uh, an estimated 22 million, 8 million in Ukraine is an enormous proportion of that. Under the Cold War, it's not just the political suffering, uh, but it's also the mismanagement. In 1968, Leonid Brezhnev announced the Brezhnev Doctrine that no one behind the Iron Curtain could leave the Soviet Union's sphere of influence. In 1987, uh, the Chernobyl nuclear uh, electrical generation uh, reactor uh, went critical during a test that was mismanaged, leading to an explosion and fallout and what's literally a death zone in that area. 1989 to 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. In the post-Soviet era, Ukraine held a referendum. 90% of Ukrainians voted for independence. They also became the de facto possessors of one third of the Soviet ICBM fleet. Ukraine, because of its suffering, particularly because of Chernobyl, announced that they would denuclearize. The Soviets took anything that was mobile, but the stuff that was in silos uh, had to be destroyed, and the supervision of that took through the 1990s into 2001. So let's come a little closer to the present. Vladimir Putin, uh, Russia's latest czar, if you will, uh, former KGB intelligence operative in Cold War Germany, highly educated. American politicians who've dealt with him find him very persuasive. He's a person who can play, if you will, quote John Lennon, mind games, if you will. Uh, he's very good at that. He's very good at winning people's confidence. He came to power in 1999, and he is now set to remain until 2036. Since he was born in 1952, by my calculations, he can stay till he's 84. His ambition is to return Russian greatness and its territories. This guy is not somebody who wants to become the next communist leader. He is very much uh, revanchist in the sense that he wants a new Russia or a Novo Rossiya. He also has um, a person on his staff who talks about the only way that Russia will achieve greatness once more post-Cold War is through expansion. That expansion means vitality. But if you take a look at his view of what a meeting with his advisors is, this is a contemporary photo. Um, Definitely, he's the one guy sitting at one end making the decisions, hence my use of the term czar. So, why does he want to control Ukraine? Number one, keep NATO forces and the European Union distant, and the further distant, the better. He continually refers to that as a key issue. Also, forward defense for Russian conventional forces, especially their navy in the Black Sea, uh, but also their nuclear forces. There are no Russian nuclear forces there now, but 
uh, I would think that that's uh, a key value should he wrest control of it. Also, routing of gas pipelines. The exporting of gas is a key asset uh, for Russia today. And whether we're talking about overland or through the uh, Black Sea, uh, the security of those pipelines, uh, et cetera. But overwhelmingly, warm water ports. Since Tsar Peter the Great, Russia needs access to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. That puts them in an excellent position to uh, exert their power. This is a map showing you the current EU member states and how close uh, Ukraine as that borderland uh, between Russia and the EU sits. Also, the strategic position of Ukraine, uh, don't have my little pointer, but uh, you can see green, you can see the Ukraine, you can see the uh, Crimea, and you can see the uh, two uh, projected pipelines traveling from uh, southwestern Russia uh, into Turkey in the Bosporus region. Okay. Uh, just to close with a couple of quick observations from a close reading of the New York Times and a few the Washington Post, et cetera. Uh, number one, uh, some intelligence picked up some papers off the ground and they found out something very interesting. Some of the MREs, if you're a war veteran, uh, meals ready to eat, what you pack when you're in the field, were discovered. This one has a 2017 expiration date some of the materials that they found Russian soldiers had discarded had 2002 expiration dates. That's telling you something about their supply chain. Also, you're talking about 20-year-old rations, but most of the draftees, and they have an enormous draft problem. They have a lot of draft dodging. The image of Putin signing a piece of paper with a lot of military people standing around him uh, shows you the day on which they extended punishments for draft dodgers. Many of the people who are serving in Ukraine are one year tours of duty. There is no expertise. That is not how you get officers up the chain of command. Estimates vary widely as to the number killed, somewhere between seven and 15,000. They've lost, um, by some estimates, seven of their generals. They are using insecure communications. The image at the bottom is uh, what's burning, is a landing ship tank called the Orsk, or the Sar Savratova, depending on who's telling you the story. In either case, their communications were broken. The ship was targeted. When it blew up, uh, two other ships fled, but both were severely damaged. This is a tremendous victory from the Ukrainian side, but it's also a revelation of Russian ineptness. Uh, their military in the field, uh, I think the news that's come out this morning about some of the uh, things that are uncovered, what has happened to civilians, uh, is uh, s shocking and uh, definitely uh, is an indication of the poor morale uh, among the forces that are fighting there. Okay, I'm finished, so. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Professor uh, Josh Spiro from uh, Political Science. Uh, uh, focused international relations and in the Department of Economics, History and Political Science. As you can see on the screen, uh, Mr. Oscar Burgos Pimentel uh, is a political science major and he's my research assistant on uh, the research project we've been doing and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. As uh, Professor Jewell said, we're more uh, on the ground types, uh, kind of the current situation and where we see emerging trends uh, heading. That said, Professor Thomas just gave you an outstanding overview, not only of Ukraine, but also Russian history toward Ukraine, as well as Ukraine's uh, capabilities in many ways, as well, finally, as some of the uh, latest 
developments uh, in Russia's war across Ukraine. And uh, I just want to say that uh, it's an extremely complicated history and extremely complicated in terms of how we understand it. So we're going to try to present to you today uh, as best uh, a set of interpretations as we can. And I just want to also uh, give you a prelude that Professor Budd will follow uh, Mr. Pimentel and, and I and give you a sense of where perhaps uh, resolution can occur uh, with this war. Although none of us, I think, can really say with any certainty uh, when or how uh, this particular war ends. So what I want to do uh, in terms of this quick overview is uh, basically keep this slide moving. This is the first of three slides. This slide's going to look at Russia's war across Ukraine. Uh, next, we'll look at the war's impact on Euro-Atlantic security, which gets at uh, our research project more broadly. And lastly, Mr. Pimentel and I will give you uh, impressions and experiences uh, that we had when we traveled to Poland, uh, which was scheduled before Russia attacked Ukraine. It's part of a research trip, uh, really the first time I've been able to do this within a faculty student research project. And as you can see from the map, Poland to the west of Ukraine is, uh, is right on the front line uh, of where this war is unfolding. So Russia's war uh, across Ukraine, and I, I just want to add that I'm going to bring Mr. Pimentel up uh, to the podium with me uh, as I move through these slides. Russia's war against Ukraine, or across Ukraine. This is the latest phase of war that began on February 24th, 2022. You can see from the smaller map in the top left, uh, those red arrows indicate Russian military forces that basically what is important to know is they, they attacked from uh, the north, so I think my cursor is working here, uh, from, from uh, the, the, uh, the, the east over here as well as the south. And given Ukrainian geography, this is Crimea, just to give you a sense of uh, it's situated, and this is the Black Sea. The 2022 war continued Russia's 2014 invasion of eastern Ukraine, particularly here and in Crimea, as Professor Thomas indicated. This war, or this continuation of it, so we're talking about this has been happening for eight years. And I tell my students in class, since, we, uh, since Russia uh, expanded its uh, invasion across the entire country, that this has been going on for eight years, specifically fighting in the east and consolidation of Ukrainian geography in Crimea. Unlike the fighting over the last eight years, the fighting over the last five weeks or so has seen some of the largest battlefield uh, intensity and destruction uh, in Europe since World War II. If you've been following the news, as I imagine many of you, uh, if not all of you have, uh, you, can't, you can't really get, get away from it, uh, you're seeing that the Ukrainian government still remains intact uh, after these five weeks or so, and its nation remains resilient and resistant. And so our presentation, as you can see in the top right, is about Ukraine's resilience, not only to save itself, but the transformation it's having on Euro-Atlantic security. And you can see in the map on the bottom left that uh, in you, you might not be able to make it out, but these are light blue areas, and these maps are pretty much maps of the last couple of days, because the updating is so difficult, especially if you're a military 
strategies to keep pace with it, but those are Ukrainian forces countering Russian forces, uh, Russian military forces. And let me add, Ukrainian civilian territorial forces in it, voluntarily in addition to Ukrainian military uh, active duty. What we're also seeing is that the Russian economy, and we'll get to this uh, on the next slide, is suffering uh, significant uh, isolation internationally and may be collapsing in some ways uh, in real time as Ukrainian civilians are dying in large numbers, as you can read about uh, in literally minute by minute updates on your phone. There's also millions of refugees from Ukraine who, as you can see on the map in the middle, have literally escaped uh, primarily uh, out of Western Ukraine here. And there's some four million of them that in just a month's time have actually fled. And you can see Poland, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, on the front line having taken in, if you've heard news reports, over two million Ukrainian refugees uh, in the span of several weeks. I don't know if we've ever seen numbers uh, of people fleeing one country and moving into another so fast. And as Mr. Pimentel and I experienced, because we saw a lot of these Ukrainians, uh, mostly women and children, uh, because the men basically from 15 through 60 are basically tasked with fighting, but they want to fight. And there's plenty of women and children who stayed in Ukraine to fight as well. This is based on their own stories that they tell the world. You still have, uh, imagine, you know, two to two and a half million people suddenly in your country. Poland is a country of the size of about 38 million. So it's an extraordinary a uh, transfer of people in a very short period of time. So as my students uh, know and sometimes fear, if one were to hypothesize, uh, you know, how things might unfold, uh, if Russia wins, and I put wins in quotation marks, whatever winning signifies, Ukraine likely ceases to exist as a sovereign nation. Now that's a hypothesis. Whether you know, some kind of Ukraine uh, could exist if Russia wins. Who knows? President, Russia President Vladimir Putin has said that Ukraine really hasn't ever existed. He said this in a number of public speeches. Shouldn't exist, and the Ukrainians are really Russians. Now, these are two Slavic peoples, but when you have a war literally for existence, no matter how the war may be going day to day, hour to hour, this is a quite a significant challenge and the historians here know uh, how that resonates and especially we international relations uh, types uh, take that quite seriously. Uh, if Ukraine prevails, in quotation marks again, whatever prevails might mean, or prevailing, a different Russia might emerge. Perhaps even a post-imperial Russia. And Professor Thomas emphasized for you that Im imperial uh, policy, as well as imperialism, means that you often try to take over geography and expand your own uh, nation, if not recreate uh, what President Putin has said uh, is the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, which is the loss of the USSR, the loss of the Soviet Union. So could he recreate with a Ukraine that then be call, gets called Russia in a new empire? Perhaps not. But is there a post-imperial Russia? if Ukraine prevails on the horizon, it's an, it's an important hypothesis to consider. 
or perhaps a more dangerous Russia emerges even without President Putin. We'd have to see. So I'm going to call up Mr. Uh, Pimentel to join me because we, uh, we had the good fortune to be able to, to travel together. And you see in the top left the, uh, the actual title of our research project uh, before really we started needing to focus, if you will, on real uh, world events unfolding so rapidly, Russia's war across Ukraine. But this still uh, has a great deal to do with what we set out at the beginning of the semester. And Mr. Pimentel is one of my research assistants and uh, is involved in an independent study with me. And we're looking at, as you can see, the fate of transatlantic relations. So that includes the United States and Canada here on the left and Europe over here. And what that signifies for the project originally and still to this day is how the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or NATO and the European Union or the EU potentially change so that they might actually start working more closely together, which is not something that they've done very effectively over the decades. These are two 70 plus year old international institutions. And you see on the screen, uh, NATO members only in dark blue, uh, EU members in kind of the lighter shade of uh, blue. But most of the countries you see are co combined uh, memberships. They're NATO and EU nations. So all of these diagonals across these light blue countries mean that these nations are both in NATO and the European Union. And that's important to consider because uh, that means they're integrated into the Europe that's emerged in the late 20th century and the 21st century. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some, uh, some pictures on the screen. You can see this is from our trip and these are some of the people we met. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kuzniar is the, the, uh, the gentleman with silver hair on the, the left. Next to me, I've got the red sweater, just if you can't see it so closely, and Mr. Pimentel prominently uh, in the, the right. Dr. Kuzniar is of the International Relations and International Security uh, Department at the University of Warsaw. Uh, I hadn't seen him since the early 1990s, so this was a great uh, reunion and you're starting to see some, uh, some of the other people we met. Uh, the gentleman on the right is the former Polish ambassador to the United States and Polish deputy ambassador to NATO, uh, Ambassador Robert Kupiecki. And you have here a gentleman named Dr. Krzysztof Silka, who worked at the European Union headquarters on foreign and defense policy. And I'm going to have Mr. Burgos Pimentel jump in uh, at any point, but we want to give you a sense of the emerging trends in discussions with these colleagues and where we see uh, and where they see in Poland as a frontline nation uh, on Ukraine's border where things are heading. Central and Eastern Europe, which is here, is, get, is redefining transatlantic and Euro-Atlantic security every day now. Galvanized by this Russian war of choice against Ukraine uh, and Poland as that frontline state. If you look at that big blue arrow and Ukraine is circled, what you see at the top are countries Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. This is actually Russia called Kaliningrad. It's actually cut off from Russia proper, uh, but you see it's not in any of these alliances. Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey. These are the countries on that front line. And the support for Ukraine as a partner, but not an ally, uh, from NATO members and other non-NATO nations is unfolding, and you see that in the news daily. But NATO has always defined itself as a defensive political and military alliance. There's debate about that, but that's how NATO's 
you know, if NATO is attacked, if any member is attacked from outside, it will defend all of its members. But it's not looking to to uh, invade uh, other unless there are international parameters that put this out there for an international institution like NATO to get involved. You've heard about sanctioning Russia financially and economically. The European Union's taken the lead on this. Other nations internationally have become involved, and the European Union is a political and economic alliance. U Ukraine's resistance and resilience has pushed the outside world to act in ways that these nations haven't acted in 70 years. So NATO is actually now considering permanently stationing military forces on the borders of those countries that that blue arrow points to, moving more lethal military equipment to the eastern borders, I'm talking about in the months and years ahead, and modernizing bases. Mr. Pimentel and I saw and actually met on the street members of the U.S. 82nd Airborne Division already deployed in Poland and on leave, you know, uh, in the cities you know, over the weekends, and we talked to them. There's also the potential, you see EU members, Finland and Sweden, where that light blue arrow is, they have affiliations and connections to NATO. They are EU members. They're considering joining NATO, uh, and we didn't anticipate that happening. NATO and EU states are significantly reducing dependency on Russia's oil and gas. They're trying to expedite uh, you know, their ways off of Russia and toward liquefied natural gas, Europe-wide cleaner energy over time. You can transition liquefied natural gas to hydroelectric uh, types of energy. It's fascinating to see what's unfolding. And I'll just move to the last slide for just a couple of seconds, but I want you to see that a natural bridge, literally, politically, economically, even militarily, for Ukraine in the future, whatever emerges, is in the heart of Europe. Germany, Poland, Ukraine. That's often in this day and age, especially now that Germany has committed to remilitarizing, which is a significant critical juncture but to do so within NATO and within the European Union. And thus our project focuses on how do NATO and EU nations m more jointly cooperate? I know our time is short, Just give us another two minutes or so. Uh, and I do wanna really hand over the mic to, to Mr. Pimentel. So, um, it was a quite eventful trip. Um, we learned many, many things, but the one thing that we witnessed and that a lot of people from Ukraine and Poland uh, did voice to us was that they know struggle. They know how to handle situations. They know how to make their way around many bad things that have happened historically and in all. And the relevance that these two countries have, and as Professor Spear was saying, as a bridge between East and Western Europe, politically and economically in terms of now, uh, in terms of how after the Russian attack in Ukraine, you know, uh, e EU dependency, energetic dependency, uh, military dependency, there's many different factors that come into that, but they know how to work their way around things and they will prevail. I am sure of that, but we shall see. Give us sense of that. The head. So the head that you guys see right there at the bottom left, is us in Krakow. Uh, that head, we do not really know what it represents, but we came up with the idea that the head represents the failure and the prevalence of the people. So any, many empires and many peoples have tried to come into the country of Poland, as well as Ukraine, um, and the people have always prevailed. And even when you have your head cut off, you still have to keep on going, just like if you cut off the chicken's head. So this is a great example of the resilience that this region holds. 
So this was us in, uh, in the heart of uh, Warsaw, in the Palace of Culture, a very nice place. Ukraine also has its own beautiful uh, landmarks. We were not able to see that, but hopefully in the future. And it was a, we also saw, uh, mind you, lots of uh, Ukrainian flags and the support was overwhelming. All over the place, we would see graffiti attacking Putin basically, um, all kinds of expre uh, uh, social expression and everyone was doing their part in any way possible to help out the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian refugees that were coming into the big cities of Poland. On the, the, the Stalin given uh, structure, this palace of, of science and culture, they hung this Ukrainian flag and in Polish, as I translated there, it says, let free Ukraine live. It's very powerful when you see this. Uh, lastly, we just want to wrap up the following, and I'm going to give you the, the last word. We visited Auschwitz. Um, we witnessed the power of human and dehumanization that people can have against other people. So when you have power and who knows what ideology you have, you might be able to cause certain damage to different peoples. In Ukraine, and this is very relevant, uh, the quote, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I would like to end it with that. That's, that's actually in Auschwitz. We're, uh, we're putting these pictures on the screen, just observing in train stations where literally thousands of Ukrainian refugees were coming in and out. You see uh, that they were temporarily, you know, based in those train stations. Uh, the gentleman on the right is actually a West Point cadet who on his spring break, he has Polish roots, he, uh, he was volunteering to help uh, these Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and and uh, we, I talked to him briefly, but as most of these pictures are what uh, Mr. Pimentel took, and we wanted to integrate them into our presentation to give you a personal feel for what this was about. So thank you for giving us a little extra time, and that's the current take. Now we'll look at the, uh, the future take. Well, he's uh, bringing that up. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk about the origins of conflicts, um, kind of look at some of the different explanations for the origins of conflict, and I'll relate those to Ukraine. Uh, then I'll look at the origins of war very briefly, and then also relate that to Ukraine conflict. Uh, but then most of the time, what I really wanted to talk about was uh, conflict resolution and the challenges of actually resolving uh, this war and bringing it to an end, which is something we'd all like to see. So I'll start off by talking about the origins of conflict, and my apologies to my peace studies students who've heard this before, but this part will be related specifically to Ukraine, so different from what we're doing in the class. Um, I talk about what I call the three misses, or just the misses, all right? So uh, misunderstanding, misperception, and miscommunication. And so each one of these leads very much to conflict, all right? So we'll start off with misunderstanding. One of the big things that happens is we often think that we understand the other person's position, but we really don't. Uh, we often tend to think that everyone looks at things the exact same way that we do, but they don't. And we often don't understand what is important to the other person, okay? So just in thinking about misunderstanding, but if you think about things you've read about the conflict in Ukraine, uh, you could come up with a whole laundry list of different misunderstandings that have led to what's going on there. I just put up there uh, misunderstandings about the expansion of NATO and what that would mean, okay? But you could come up with countless other examples of different misunderstandings that have brought us to the point we are today. The other thing we want to look at is uh, misperception, so the second miss. Um, perceive the other's intentions. Uh, we also often misperceive the other's aims and also their behavior. Okay, and we tend to assume the absolute worst about the other's intentions. Okay, um, as we'll get into a little later, we often always see only goodness in our own side and only evil in the other side. Okay, and so there's this misperceptions always, and that those misperceptions contribute to conflict. 
Uh, so uh, again, I <laughs> could have come up with countless examples of misperceptions and how those led to the conflict and where we are today. But I think one of the biggest ones, uh, Putin really misperceived the West's resolve and its ability to unite. I think he totally underestimated the West's ability to come together and how important we would see it. So I think misperception really played a key role in getting us to where we are. And lastly, miscommunication. All right. Um, we often hear what we want to hear, okay? So we think we're listening. Uh, one of my former colleagues who uh, taught in communications media always said that it was really interesting that we offer courses in speech, but we don't offer any courses in listening, okay? And uh, we don't listen well. And again, we often hear what we think we, what we want to hear. Uh, we, we also tend to think that the other side heard what we said and also understood our intentions, okay? Again, because we always think our intentions are honorable, so surely they must have understood us and understood that our intentions are completely honorable, when in fact they didn't. Uh, we often ignore the things that go unspoken, so a lot of things never get said in these discussions. We tend to downplay the impact that feelings have on what is heard, and we often fail to express how we feel. And blame. The blame game is really key to conflicts, okay? Uh, most conflicts focus a lot of attention on who is to blame, all right? Each side blames the other. Uh, both sides tend to see themselves as always the victim and the, uh, others blame the other side. Uh, and we focus a lot on uh, who is at fault, and that tends to make the conflicts actually worse. So once again, I could have picked lots of different examples of miscommunication, but um, I think Biden's warnings uh, to Putin just fell on deaf ears. Uh, Biden probably thought, oh, surely he heard us, surely he heard you know, what I was saying and that uh, you know, we'll be resolved and we'll stand up to him, but uh, Putin didn't. Another big area, and you would have to go on <laughs> too long, so I'm just gonna very briefly touch on it, but in thinking about the origins of conflict is the impact that identity has on conflict. So as um, Professor Thomas said, uh, and Professor Spiro also, uh, Putin has claimed that Ukraine never even existed, all right, and that the Ukrainian people are really just Russians, all right, but they don't see themselves that way, okay, and that's the reality. There is a Ukraine, there has been a Ukraine, and they see themselves as Ukrainian. So identity plays a really important role in leading to conflict because what happens is you get sort of an in-group and an out-group, all right? And the in-group is that favored group, and the out-group experiences discrimination. So during the uh, Cold War, the whole history of the Soviet Union, uh, all the experiences of the Ukrainians that they experienced as the out-group, and uh, you know, you can talk about the famine, et cetera, all the deaths of Ukrainians, as was touched upon by my colleague. So that definitely created a sense of, and us versus them, and us being the out-group, and them being the in-group. Um, what happens is that people get mobilized around their identity against the other group. So there are those shared grievances. So again, I think that's really what uh, Putin misperceived. He misperceived that there's a Ukrainian people and that sense of grievance that they have uh, over unequal treatment that they've had in the past, uh, and their common desire to protect a, their valued identity, all right? He didn't see them as feeling like, oh, that they are Ukrainians, but they do. Uh, that sense of grievance uh, shaped, is shaped by the extent of co uh, collective disadvantage. So all that experience of discrimination, also the salience, in other words, the strength of the group identity, and the extent of how, group, uh, how coherent the group is, and also repressive control by the dominant group. So that's conflict in general, thinking about the origins of conflict. Now I want to touch on briefly the origins of war. And uh, Professor Spiro and myself, we both study international relations. We talk about different levels of analysis. There's the individual level, the national level, and the international level. On the, interne on the individual level, um, we would look at something like Putin's personality, all right? And so you could do a whole psychological study of Putin and how that kind of led him to uh, to make the decision to attack Ukraine. Uh, bad decisions on the individual level also help explain uh, the, getting the war. On the national level, we mo focus more on things like nationalism in Russia, also it, political ideologies. So this is very much like a fight versus democracy. Um, Russia and China kind of saying, you know, autarkies or authoritarian systems are the way to go and are a model for other countries. So there's that aspect on the national level. And again, Russia's alliance with China also plays an important role in contributing to the war. And finally, on the international level, you got to really look at uh, Russian feelings of being slighted by the global system, all right? Um, 
this is a long, I won't go into this tangent, but World War I, uh, big reason why you got World War I is because Germany wanted to shake up the system because they felt that the global system didn't represent them or recognize them as a global power. And that's kind of what Russia's feeling, okay? So they want to kind of shake up the system in order to try to uh, make it represent them as a major power. But also, they want to shake up the American-dominated uh, global system, okay? And that's a big part of their thinking. All right, so what I really want to talk about, and hopefully I haven't gone on too long, is the challenges of conflict resolution. And on one side of the screen there, you have the arguments in favor of war termination. So arguments that would push aside to decide, okay, we've got to just end this. Let's stop this war. And on the other side would be arguments against war termination. Arguments would make them think, okay, let's just keep going. Let's keep pressing on. All right? So I just want to highlight a couple that I put there in bold. Uh, external support is unlikely. Maybe if China actually took a stance and said, no, we condemn this invasion, we're not going to give you any support, and we don't support what you're doing, that could possibly push Putin to try to bring it to a close. Uh, the domestic situation is untenable. In other words, there's a lot of social and political unrest, and that hampers the war effort. Think about Vietnam, oh, what's going on there. That's not happening in Russia. There are protests. Uh, the problem is that Putin's been able to kind of clamp down information about what's going on in Ukraine, so uh, people in Russia don't really know enough about what's happening. But if we were to see a bunch of protests, that could also uh, put pressure on him to bring the war to an end. If the oligarchs uh, got tired of losing their money and their yachts and put pressure on Putin to end it, all right. The flip side, uh, time is on our side. We just need to maintain pressure on the enemy. That's what really scares me. Putin just feeling like, oh, I'll just keep you know, bombarding them, and I'll just bomb them to smithereens, and you know, I'll, I'll just wait it out, and you know, I can keep going forever and ever. And another one, the sunk costs are higher, high. Sunk costs are sort of what you've already invested. Uh, during the Vietnam War, we always talked about the sunk costs. You know, we've gone on so far, how could we stop now? And that's unfortunately, I think, you know, what Putin kind of feels like, you know, I've invested all this in this war effort, how could I stop this effort at this point? I put those on side by side deliberately because what I want you to kind of think about is one of the big challenges with conflict resolution is that when one side is up, the other side is down. Uh, and so when one side is up, they don't really have any incentive to stop the conflict because they're up. Things are going okay for them. All right, the side that's down, they want to stop the conflict. All right, the challenge of conflict resolution is getting both sides to the point where they want to stop the conflict, all right? And so that's what we really need to push for and push Putin to recognize that he needs to get it. The Ukrainians want to end the conflict. They don't want to be bombed to smithereens. So get uh, Putin to recognize and be willing to kind of step down, as I'll talk about. There's a term that we use in the literature, which is um, a conflict becomes ripe for resolution. What that means is that it's ready to be resolved, okay? And so what makes a situation ripe for resolution? This is what we call a hurting stalemate, where both sides kind of are stymied and they realize they can't achieve their goals uh, through violence anymore, so then they'll back down. If there's a recent catastrophe or near catastrophe, what we call the precipice model, so they kind of come up to the edge of this precipice and say, whoa, we've got to step back, you know, this isn't going well. Uh, or they're conscious of an impending uh, catastrophe or their position is going down. Or an enticing opportunity, the stars are lined up and so they could actually achieve their goals peacefully rather than through violence. Now the challenge is that a situation could be ripe for resolution and not actually get resolved. Both sides need to recognize that it's ripe for resolution and both sides need to say, okay, let's resolve this. Um, some challenges to pushing it to um, resolution. Ethnocentrism, that's where both sides look at the situation through the perspective of their own group. So what happens is they don't have any empathy for the other side. They can't relate to the other side, so they're not willing to kind of make peace. What we call reactive devaluation, that's where if the other side proposed something, like a proposed a peace agreement, then the response is, oh, well, they proposed it, so it can't be good, okay? They just kind of reject it out of hand. But unfortunately, it happens a lot in these negotiations. Uh, there's also what we call mirror imaging, 
which is the tendency of the propensity of each side to kind of see its own actions, as I indicated, uh, only as being with rectitude, in other words, only positively, whereas the other side's actions are always uh, evil and bad and everything, all right? So it makes it hard for them to be willing to compromise. And then I had to throw this in for, because of Putin, uh, the macho factor, all right? Uh, it's tough to get someone like Putin to back down, all right? And so I think that's really a huge challenge. Uh, again, just his psyche, just the nature of Putin, it makes it very challenging for, get, for him to be willing to, to move away from the conflict. All right, so in negotiating the end for a conflict, there are kind of three strategies you can do. Uh, compromise, where you kind of split the difference, okay. Uh, Zero-sum negotiations, that's where you try to wring as many concessions out of the enemy as possible. That's what I fear Putin uh, will try to do unless he can be, uh, be reasoned with, all right? So again, that's where you try to maximize the other side's concessions. You see the situation, what we call a zero-sum game. So a win for you is a loss for them. A win for them would be a loss for you, all right? The alternative is what we call integrative bargaining. That's where you try to find something in between, something that both sides can see as a win-win solution. Um, in the literature on peace studies, they always talk about these two sisters who are fighting over an orange, okay? They're both doing some baking and both want the orange for the recipe that they're about to bake, okay? And um, the situation is they fight over the orange and finally, after you know, all this fighting and they're not speaking to each other, they cut the orange in half and so one, si one sister gets half the orange, other sister gets the other half. That sounds like a good solution, compromise, okay? But the thing is, in this case, one of the sisters, she only wanted the juice. She just needed all the juice out of the orange. And the other sister just wanted the rind of the orange, the peel, okay? So if they had actually focused on what their goals were, what was important to them, what mattered to them, they could have actually found a situation where one sister got the entire rind and one sister got all the juice, and then they would have actually maximized the gains that they got. But by, focusing, by not focusing on their goals and instead just kind of fighting it out and then finally just cutting the orange in half, they didn't actually achieve the best solution that was possible. So you want to try to reframe the conflict into what we call sort of a win-win solution. And I'll just cl close with this. In the literature and you're looking at uh, different conflicts, the thing that you always see that's really important is a security guarantee. The weaker side needs to feel that they will be safe. They need to feel that uh, they're going to be secure after the fighting stops, okay? That they don't have to worry about their security. Uh, what can happen is a third party, it could be one nation, it could be a group of nations, needs to promise to guarantee the security of that nation. So basically what needs to happen is, uh, now if Ukraine joined NATO, they would have such a security guarantee because an attack on one NATO state is an attack on all, but Putin won't go for that. Okay, so what needs to be arranged is some sort of security guarantee that falls just short of what would happen if uh, Ukraine was allowed to join NATO, all right? So they need to have their security guaranteed and then at the same time, some concessions made to Putin so he will hopefully be willing to back down. So on that, uh, I think we'd like to throw it open for questions and comments. Okay, so I passed out some index cards. If anybody wants to give me their index card, I can ask your question or I can pass the mic. For those of you on the chat, if you can hear me, uh, I can take questions in the chat as well. So I'll keep half an eye on that. Questions from the floor or from up here? No? No? Good. Yes, okay. Um, so this is for Professor Thomas. Um, do you believe that um, diplomatic solutions such as like a specific trade agreement regarding the resources or transportation fee for having um, the oil pipeline or gas pipeline go through U Ukraine, um, do you believe it would be more beneficial when it comes to Ukraine's warm ports and gas pipelines? Okay. Oh, oh we set. Yeah, we set. Okay. Um, I'm glad you asked about diplomatic uh, solutions. I come from uh, a perspective of 
interviewing uh, diplomats who've worked in the Middle East. So if you're looking for an area where there's a lot of political frustration, uh, that's one. But one of the things that occurred to me while I was listening to Professor Budd's excellent uh, presentation was uh, one diplomat reflecting on how you generally know when you've got the deal. In other words, when you know you've got as much. And uh, her perspective was you have to understand what each side will settle for. Uh, and I think this is the difficult puzzle that you're putting together. If there were guarantees for, say, naval base access to Odessa, for um, pipeline transit with fees that were uh, pleasing, uh, it's possible that something might be negotiated. I think the problem from the Ukrainian side is what does, how does Zelensky ever uh, get his people to agree to anything that's, that gives up anything given what they've been through, particularly with the, res uh, with the revelations that have come out about how civilians have been treated by the retreating forces. But um, I don't think Putin's in a good place to, to hold ground um, but I think Zelensky and the, you know, even if you talk about the uh, Ukrainian Air Force working with, you know, outdated planes and, and getting the results that they have, uh, it's going to be very difficult to tell them to compromise for a lot less. Um, I, I think they're looking for the whole thing back. So, uh, yeah, I think you, you, you put your finger on something that's very difficult. How do you actually figure out what is a good deal for both sides. Okay, thank you. All right, so this one's for Professor Budd. Um, so do you believe that um, if Ukraine and Russia were to stay in conflict, that the Russian's economy wouldn't be stable enough or sustainable enough to maintain the high costs of the war? That's a really good question. Um, I would, I would think that it would be for a period of time, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think what they're really trying to do, what worries me is they're just trying to wait it out and uh, get the most that they can get. Um, so there's, there, there sanctions apply and sanctions hurt, but there are leaks in sanctions, and that's the big challenge, okay? So, I mean, there are plenty of countries who are still willing to take Russian oil, including our allies, yeah. So we have to really make it hurt a lot more. Um, but if you're talking about with the current level of sanctions, yeah, I think they could actually, unfortunately, go for quite a while longer. So I have another conflict resolution question here. Uh, and Shelby's asking, uh, and I'm gonna put the two together, for if there's any recent examples of successful conflict resolutions in recent history that perhaps could be a model? This could be for the whole panel. Um, and specifically, are there any parallels uh, with Pakistan and Bangladesh war in 1971? So any kind of recent models that we might look to from your perspectives? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll at least start, and certainly my colleagues, all three are here can can jump in. Uh, if you look at the uh, civil wars in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, so that's not that long ago, uh, and you actually look at the international outside intervention to try to help promote the peace as those civil wars had uh, dragged on for a number of years. Yugoslavia not only broke up from 1990 to 95, but you had several hundred thousand people killed, and you had several million refugees that fled what was the former Yugoslavia. And you can see it to some extent. You can see Serbia on the screen, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, what is called Macedonia on this map. Uh, and you see the green in the middle there, that's actually Bosnia. Uh, this isn't the best map for names and specifics, but it had nice colors, so I picked it uh, for this presentation. But when you look at how the peace treaty was uh, formed, you looked at several leaders brought together from Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia. You looked at the outside intervention uh, by 
NATO and what was emerging as the European Union in terms of trying to work the negotiations together. And when you see the angles that Professor Budd put on the screen about mediation and trying to find ways to end conflict, and this was a way to end it, not just a civil war, but a number of civil wars that spread uh, and threatened to spread into Europe. Uh, the, the war fighting was devastating. The scale of destruction uh, is already being neared in several weeks in Ukraine. This was over several years in this uh, former entity we knew as Yugoslavia during the Cold War. And they have a model, and it's still holding up today. There's a fragile piece. You, you hear war, places like Kosovo as well as Bosnia, but there are models for conflict resolution, uh, but it needs painstaking change. And as Professor Budd as well as Professor Thomas and Mr. Pimentel saw this firsthand on the ground, you know, economic change, financial upheaval, as well as financial reform, that takes time. And when I'm saying reform, I'm talking about how do sanctions really have a lasting effect. Uh, most of the world is not supporting sanctions against Russia. If you actually look at about 75% of the world's countries are not supporting the sanctions. But what's fascinating is that you're starting to see, uh, and I'll end with this, Germany is changing faster than people realize. And I focus on Germany because it's in the heart of Europe. It's where I take students, and you saw the blurb for 2023 in the spring, Germany and Poland. Germany's changing fast, and both my colleagues alluded to Germany in their presentations, just how quickly things can change with Germany. But now Germany's in an integrated Europe. It's in NATO, it's in the European Union, it's not looking to break out of it. And you're hearing in the last 48 to 72 hours, they're finally starting to say, how do we be really start, break, uh, start to break our oil and mostly gas dependency on Russia? And it's close to 50% for Germany. That's their energy supplies from Russia. Now that's a big change. Does that lead to a model for conflict resolution? That's how you start to choke off uh, economically and financially Russia. And, but that's a dangerous game to play. But you're already seeing how much destruction has happened. So in other words, uh, we've got to figure out, we, the world, and those involved in potential negotiations, what happens. I can certainly talk about Ukraine's future, but I'll leave that for another answer. Anyone else want to weigh in on models? <laughs> I can't really speak of Pakistan, I'm sorry. But um, I, I, it's interesting, First Spiro was talking about former Yugoslavia, a lot of those conflicts are really that have been successfully resolved, if they've been successfully resolved, are actually civil wars, as opposed to in this case, we're talking about two independent nations fighting with each other. So now I'm thinking Ethiopia versus Eritrea or some other uh, wars. It's very interesting, actually, in the, since the ending of the Cold War, there haven't been that many actual wars between countries. and. Most of them haven't really ended very well, like uh, in terms of actually having a peace agreement. Uh, so, I mean, you can think about us with Afghanistan, us with Iraq, all right? So those are not really great models for us of uh, very long-lasting conflicts. So that's kind of sad. And just a little quick point of Professor Spiro was bringing up sort of about the idea of economic integration. This whole war is really challenging our theories because um, our theory would be that as economies get more and more integrated, there's no incentive to go to war with each other. So based on that theory, Russia is stupid going to war over Ukraine, all right? Yet we have the war there. So it really challenges our, our, our theories, which are, you know, would be that you shouldn't have had a conflict like this. Thanks. All right, any other questions from the field? Here we go. Uh, thank you. Thank you for helping us to see better. Uh, I, my question is about accountability. Does accountability have a um, role to play in conflict resolutions? In my mind, the ICC, 
uh, uh, will it make sense, for example, for the United States to change its position regarding the International Criminal Court? Because Biden is calling Putin um, a, a war criminal, I think he is, and there's abundance of evidence. But uh, United States position is weakening uh, this mechanism. So uh, what do you think uh, uh, accountability will, will do? Great question. I'll take it quickly, and then Mr. Spiro or anyone else wants to. Um, it's an excellent question, and there needs to be accountability. But I was actually talking to a student uh, earlier today. I think that um, Biden made a, might have put the uh, carriage before the horse, and I think that was maybe a mistake. Um, calling for a trial of Putin and all that, uh, because that just raises the stakes for Putin. And so while I agree with the sentiment, and as I said to the student, I think his heart was in the right place. I'm not sure it was really the right, dis right move in, in really publicly calling for that. Um, down the road, I think there could very well be trials because um, war crimes have been committed. Um, you're not supposed to attack civilians, and that clearly has been violated. So down the road, yeah, there needs to be accountability. And that also kind of goes with that security guarantee that I talked about is sort of a, accountability goes with that, that guarantee. Um, but we have to kind of get them to the point where they can actually that talk to each other and reach some sort of agreement before we kind of handle accountability. Uh, I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I, I think in the context of uh, like an international uh, criminal trial, The Hague, something like that, you would have to have a totally defeated Russia for that to happen. Um, I think accountability of individual Russian commanders, that's possible. Um, but what I would be thinking is uh, perhaps the long-term effect of sanctions, but also of the breaking of relations in terms of um, university uh, partnerships. Uh, there are over 500 global companies which have pulled out I think that may force a different kind of accountability in that there may be forces within Russia that might think it is time to remove Putin and that the accountability might not come from the more traditional path that we think of. That uh, long-term suffering with um, no access to international banking um, the prevention of Russian airlines landing in or you, traveling, transiting European airspace might be the leverage that might remove Putin from office. That's possible. I don't know. And, and along those lines, people may not realize, but several hundred thousand Russians, uh, at least from what the numbers indicate, ha have been leaving Russia, including a lot of the intellectuals and artists and creative parts of society, which is significant because they know what's, what's happening and they disagree with it, but they know if they stay, they'll be held to account by likely being imprisoned. Accountability. The, uh, the International Criminal Court, which is part of the United Nations and the International Court of Justice and based at The Hague in the Netherlands, which, by the way, we visit on our Heart of Europe trip in spring 2023. It's this fascinating part of the world before we get to Germany, because uh, we land in Amsterdam. Uh, the International Criminal Court, the, the international lawyers and the legal teams are already collecting data and evidence on potential Russian war crimes. That's been happening for several weeks, according to the media. Uh, Unfortunately, the United States is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court, which I think you were getting at, meaning it hasn't signed the treaty yet, which means it, it doesn't have much influence on this, and neither uh, has Russia. That said, I'll end by indicating that accountability, so the International Court of Justice also has plenty of international legal staffers, so you lawyers in the making out there, international law is quite fascinating in and of itself. There can be a tribunal, and I think both Professors Bud and 
Thomas were getting at this. You can have an international tribunal like you did against uh, Serbian, uh, you know, uh, President Slobodan Milosevic, uh, as well as even a tribunal that gets set up like in Nuremberg. And you heard Ukrainian President Zelensky refer to Nuremberg because he knows that the large powers around the world can support this. The United States, you don't have to be a signatory to support a tribunal. But Professor Thomas's last point needs to be, you know, considered significantly, as does Professor Buds, which is that, you know, Professor Pu Professor President Putin is not looking, you know, to leave on his own accord. And what I raised, what we raised in our presentation is, well, what might come after President Putin? It doesn't necessarily mean it's better. You could put evidence together for commanders and politicians who were involved in decisions if you can get that kind of information and documentation, and they can be put on trial, and they have been from other countries in these types of wars, civil wars, or wars where you actually see in the 21st century one country attacking uh, another. We have time for another two or three more questions. I know Joe had one here, and then I see two and three in the back. So. Thank you. So I have a question relating to Crimea, Crimea and other areas of Ukraine that were annexed and I was just wondering, I've heard a lot of information about that with the influence of Russia with elections and backing of rebels. And I was wondering if the anyone in the panel had any context to provide regarding those situations. This is an extraordinarily important and complicated question. Uh, and I'm not an authority on the Russians and Ukrainians that mix together in where I'm pointing my cursor on the screen. This is, you know, the, the regions that have been disputed politically and otherwise since the 2014 invasion, and Crimea's down here. The mixture of Russian and Ukrainian families, and now the killing of Russians and Ukrainians uh, escalating in this region. Thousands of people have died in this region over the last eight years before the February 24th, 2022 invasion. There are mercenaries, there are rebels, there are any number of splinter groups that get grouped together, President Putin in Moscow, you know, up here, and President Zelensky, Ukrainian president here uh, in Kyiv, uh, dispute one another about who's against whom. The, uh, the challenge is that uh, this is ripped apart families, but there are Russians who are Ukrainian citizens who have stated publicly when they've been interviewed in these war-torn regions, we can never trust the Russians again, and they're Russian. And they may have been supporting these renegade groups who were fighting supposedly Ukrainians versus Russians. As we've said, these are Slavic peoples. They're really very similar. President Putin says there's no difference between and among them, but, but there are many historical differences in the thousand-year-old Kievan Rus, Russian Empire, and now Russian and Ukrainian separate nations. And let's not forget, Ukraine was independent uh, when the Soviet Union first emerged. And then it regained its independence in 1991 when the USSR collapsed 70 years later. Um, to say that this is a mess is an understatement. To say that it has resolution, I, I don't, I'm not sure. If I were on an international negotiating team, I would have to think, well, all I'm hearing in the media lately is that, well, President Putin's real strategy was for consolidation of eastern Ukraine all along. He just decided to uh, 
deflect attention by trying to invade the capital and blow up other major cities, consolidate down here uh, to connect to Crimea, and he wants this part of Ukraine to become Russia. Well, I would say m that that's likely going to uh, entail m much more massive upheaval of people and history and their their livelihood, their existence. Uh, but also, it might be uh, the case that what shall we say about a hundred miles east of Kiev, and if you if you divide that and western, that becomes in effect western Ukraine, but a Ukraine, and the eastern part becomes Russia. You're already hearing discussions in Brussels, Belgium, which is where both the European Union and NATO headquarters are located, about the Europeans discussing what they started discussing in 2013 and 2014, which is Ukraine's uh, transition is into the European Union. If you want to talk about security guarantees, it gets very dicey, but having worked NATO issues for over 30 years in the government, and now, you know, interested, I'm still interested in them here, of course, at Fitchburg State, uh, who's to say West Ukraine becomes the new Ukraine and then that integrates into Europe? How that happens, I don't know. But I've been working with the Ukrainians for almost 40 years, so they're, they're quite something. Leave you w with that. Anyone else want to weigh in? All right, there are two hands back here, right here. Uh, for Dr. Bud, uh, there was a mention about compromise and how you can focus on what is best for both parties. Isn't it, it's a little bit more complex when one is an aggressor, but we see that like overly uh, aggressive and a harmful peace treaties like what happened at the end of World War I led to the Nazi party, but also appeasement where you just give them whatever they want also did not slow down said Nazi party. What do you think is the best uh, solution? Because giving Russia anything kind of rewards them for this, but also giving them nothing could lead to further radicalization or harm down the line. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, I think you have to give them something, though, because otherwise there's no incentive for them to stop. And like I said earlier, they could kind of just keep, just wait it out, just keep bombing and bombing and all. Um, so I, I understand the danger of giving something and, you know, that the, the appeasement problem. And so, you know, and so you give Putin a little bit and then he'll just keep wanting more and more and more. Um, the only thing I would counter that with is the fact that uh, he's learned an interesting lesson which he hadn't anticipated. Uh, he grossly underestimated what would happen if he attacked Ukraine. And so I think that um, there could be some sort of solution found that would give him something while not, while making, letting him realize, he's already realized, but you're reinforcing that idea to him that this was a dumb move that you made and any further incursions would be met accordingly. That, that security guarantee, I guess, basically. So if you think about, you know, the problem of treaties after World War I, et cetera, there was no kind of security guarantees and Germany was allowed to just kind of rot and uh, just you know, fall apart. But if we don't allow that to happen to Ukraine and give them a security guarantee, that also sends a signal to Putin. It's not like you, you won this victory and now you're gonna get another victory down the road, keep going. Okay, last question here, and then we have lots of food and time to discuss amongst ourselves. Um, this is for the entire panel, pretty much. Um, based on Putin's stance on Ukraine and joining NATO, and the recent um, initialization from Poland to host uh, United States nuclear warheads, do you think Poland is more trying to intimidate Russia? because of like what's going on or are they trying to build up defense on that western border? Um, so I paid a lot of attention when I was in Poland and 
I talked to a lot of experts face to face, and it was great. And from what I understood, from what I, I understood from them, is that they sort of want to move. They want nukes, basically. <laughs> they want nukes. The, the Polish people want nukes, and they are aware of their position in Europe. And they, the government is taking the, the, the stance, you know, to, to allow uh, for different measures to, to come into the country, you know, uh, NATO, uh, EU partnerships, and all kinds of different military uh, conjunctions, I could say. Um, and they really want to push that narrative that they can be and are, in a way, already, the, the divide between, you know, the free world, having Belarus and, and all that next to them in Kaliningrad. Um, so they do, they do, in a way, want to become that. So you mentioned the, nu the nuclear warheads, and throughout history, aside from the two events that nu nuclear warheads were actually used, it's always been a just-in-case um, from 1945 all the way up until today, it's been a just in case. Uh, we've heard talk of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, potentially using one that has died down. Thank God for that. But um, a lot of what I've gathered from looking at the situation in Poland from the outside, obviously Oscar was there, uh, so was uh, Dr. Spiro. But from looking at it on American soil, um, it seems as though Poland is taking up a primarily defensive stance. Um, because we don't know if Russia is going to stop or where they're going to stop. If the goal is to only take the U only take back Ukraine or to continue in all the way over to well Berlin. And I just wanted to point. I have one comment from the chat here uh, from Professor Lawrence Ova. A lengthy statement has been released this morning by Dmitry Medvedev, a senior ally of Vladimir Putin and former Russian president that is perceived as a cause for alarm among those who believe Moscow has imperialistic ambitions beyond Ukraine. What are your thoughts in response to the closing line in the statement identified as perhaps the most ominous, suggesting Moscow's goal in the conflict is to finally build an open Eurasia from Lisbon to Vladivostok? I thought that sort of coincided with this question as well. And I'll take any other final comments before we close. So the, uh, the statement was, what, from Lisbon, Portugal, to Vladivostok in the Far East in Siberia, near uh, China. What, what type of security system does the former Russian President Medvedev want to have? This is always an interesting game to... For R Russia? Um, well, that, that's quite a, a, a leap to take since that would involve, uh, let me just step back. One has to look at these statements in a larger context than a couple of sentences. Uh, it is, it is uh, former Russian President Medvedev who, who changes off with President Putin on prime ministership and presidency. They've done that for the last quarter century. Um, the statement about nuclear weapons being used and n nuclear warheads on territories of countries like Poland, but nuclear weapons being used by Russia to make its point, uh, you know, in Ukraine. Uh, you have to look at those statements in terms of what the Russians want to achieve beyond Ukraine. And you're talking about all, all of the countries to the west of Ukraine and that on the map here, uh, except for Kaliningrad up here, which is, as you see, part of Russia, but it's actually cut off from Russia itself. All of these countries are members of NATO and the European Union. So how, how does Russia, you know, threaten them with what it wants potentially in terms of imperialistic tendencies? Russia is already a member of international institutions. Its power is felt widely, but let's also maybe by closing just put into context. I don't know if Professor Thomas said this in her presentation. Russia is a country of 11 time zones and 140 million people. It's one third the population of the United States 
it, its population is dwindling, if you have some of its heart and soul leaving and potentially never returning, uh, you know, because of this war, it, 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 Russia's always survived over a thousand years of invasions as well as invading others. Uh, hopefully nuclear war doesn't occur. Uh, you have, I think, the challenge unfolding of what type of era are we entering? Is this a Medvedev, Putin era of uh, Russia wants to uh, throw its power around as it can uh, internationally and push, you know, countries that aren't typically interested in, in being so uh, uh, forth, you know, right. I mean, that's most of Europe. Europe wants peace on the whole. They've been through world wars. But I couldn't help think, uh, thinking that when Mr. Pimentel, Oscar, and I were together for a week in Poland, that we were actually entering a new era that's not necessarily a new Cold War. And it's not like the eras that preceded World Wars I and II necessarily, but it's something different. And I've taken 10 trips to Poland, as I said in my presentation over the last nearly 35 years. And I, I, I was changed by this trip in ways that I've never experienced. Meaning, uh, and my students are usually changed a lot when they go on these trips. Their lives are transformed. Um, but I thought, this is a new era. Where it's heading, I'm not sure. But it's going to take great uh, leadership and maybe President Biden likes to put the, uh, the, the, the cart before the horse maybe he does a lot of that purposely because he knows that he, he wants to get certain thoughts out there to start getting people thinking not just about war criminals but about the new era the critical juncture in what we call Euro-Atlantic security, but also international security. So I'll end with that. Well, thank you all for coming. Have some food. Thank our panel.